Well, good morning. Uh, I would like to first like thank the MJD Foundation for organizing this very relevant meeting that brings together uh, the patients and the researcher uh, researchers communities and also for giving the opportunity uh, today uh, to talk about the, our first efforts uh, in my lab to identify novel genes that can regulate the abundance of mutant toxin 3. Um, so I think we all uh, kind of agree that reducing levels of mutant toxin 3 is a good strategy for uh, therapeutic development for MJD and uh, that really acting uh, upstream on the pathogenic cascade can like eliminate whatever uh, pathogenic mechanisms these mutant protein causes in cells. Um, so in a very simplistic way, how do cells actually control the stability and degradation of a toxin 3? And this is a very simplistic overview because we all know like uh, lots of genes and proteins that are involved in regulating this protein. But uh, we know that mutant toxin 3 can misfold and then be ubiquitinated through like a, a, a series of like ubiquitination uh, related enzymes and be polyubiquitinated and degraded through the proteasome. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, misfolded atoxin 3 can be refolded through chaperones, and then in this way, we can eliminate toxic oligomers and fibrils. And uh, we also know, as uh, we talk about a lot about these in this meeting already, that misfolded atoxin 3 and the oligomers or uh, aggregates can be degraded through macroautophagy. So, um, what we are really interested in my lab is to really uh, use unbiased approaches to identify novel genes that we can use as novel targets for therapeutic interve intervention for this disease. And our uh, first efforts uh, uh, were, uh, were like to identify, uh, to use a cell model in our like pipeline for drug and target discovery that we developed in the lab to identify uh, genes uh, from like a library of druggable genes about, we screened about 3,000 genes that uh, uh, comprise kinases, uh, GPCRs, and phosphatases, and proteins involved in protein quality control, basically. Um, and we used our uh, cell model uh, that allow us, that is like a stable 293 cell line that expresses uh, mutant toxin 3 infusion with firefly luciferase. So in this cell line, we can easily detect levels, indirectly levels of mutant toxin 3 that is expressed in fusion with firefly luciferase by adding like the substrate for firefly luciferase and then measuring luminescence. And so in this way, we can plate these cells in the i throughput uh, platforms and treat them either with compounds or with siRNAs and then add the substrate and measure luminescence and have uh, the, detec uh, the detection of indirect detection of mutant ataxin 3. So in this first study, uh, we uh, used these cells to screen initially about like 3,000 uh, genes. And, and then from these primary assay, uh, we uh, selected uh, 100 genes. And we selected 80 genes that, when knocked down, would decrease levels of ataxin 3, and 20 genes that, when knocked down, would increase levels of ataxin 3. And then we used uh, a second confirmation assay. Uh, I forgot to say on the primary screen, what we did was we screened, um, we used a pool of four individual uh, siRNAs targeting in each gene. So four individual siRNAs on the same well uh, uh, targeting each gene. And then on the second screen, we uh, bought the four individual uh, siRNAs targeting these 100 genes, and we uh, screened them separately using our 
cell model and also using a counter screen cell model that only expresses firefly will see phrase. In this way, we can eliminate false positives that are targeting firefly will see phrase and, uh, and not a taxing three. And from this confirmation screen, um, we had 33 genes that passed uh, these uh, counter screen. Um, so next, we use these four individual siRNAs and we screen them in a different cell model that doesn't have firefly will see phrase, that only expresses uh, mutant ataxin 3. And from the 33 genes, uh, we uh, were able to confirm using Western blot um, uh, about like 15 genes. And we confirmed uh, 12 genes that when knocked down would increase levels of ataxin 3 and three genes that when knocked down would decrease levels of ataxin Taxin 3. And I'm just going to give one example of one, uh, whoops, of one gene that we will uh, further uh, like focus on, which is FBXL3, uh, and uh, just to show you our readout. So when we use like four different siRNAs targeting FBXL3, in three cases, uh, we could, uh, when we knock down, we could increase levels of uh, FBXL3 compared with uh, our control, with our controls. And um, then, uh, so we'll, how about like, do these actually 15 genes interact with each other uh, and give us like a clue of like a pathway that uh, is regulating levels of ataxin 3? And they do actually, it's a very small number of genes, but they actually uh, all kind of like form a network related with TNF alpha and EF kappa B and uh, ARC 1 and 2 pathways. So this was kind of interesting and novel. But what we did next in our like uh, pipeline of uh, of uh, of the screen was to confirm these genes in vivo. If the if the knockdown of these genes would actually translate uh, in the increase or decrease levels of the toxin three in vivo, and we collaborated with the Todd Lab at Wayne State University. And he used this model that uh, expresses mutant ataxin 3 in the eyes, um, mutant ataxin 3 in the eyes, uh, and also co-expressed GFP. So uh, when we have mutant ataxin 3, we have lo lower, uh, less fluorescence because the cells get uh, ataxin 3 is toxic. And, and then there's a decrease uh, of, uh, there's neurotoxicity and decrease of fluorescence. And that's the readout for this screen. So among the 15 genes, we only uh, could uh, find like 10 orthologs in Drosophila and e screen those uh, three, uh, th those 10 gen, 10 genes, and seven of them, we could actually confirm our results from the cells. And um, as you can see here, all of them actually were genes that when knocked down would increase levels of ataxin 3 and in Drosophila would increase toxicity and then would have like less of uh, less fluorescence and, uh, and uh, increased toxicity as we can see over here. Then uh, he used the second Drosophila model that does not express GFP and uh, by histology, we were able to confirm four genes, FBXL3, CHD4, and C3R, and HR, that would increase abundance and toxicity of, uh, in these SCA3 flies. So this was very interesting, and uh, because uh, FBXL3 is a F-box protein, we kind of like uh, focus more on uh, studying this gene. And why did we uh, focus more on, uh, on FB FBXL3? Because uh, uh, FBXL3 is a F-box protein that works together with Colin-1 that is like an E3 ligase. And an E3 ligase uh, is an enzyme that finally adds like ubiquitins to substrates. So FBXL3 is a protein that interacts with substrates and bring them to the E3 ligase to polyubiquitination and possibly degradation by the proteasome. So our last piece of uh, data, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, 
um, uh, is that we then uh, use um, uh, human uh, neuronal progenitor cells derived from um, uh, SCA3 human embryonic stem cell uh, that expresses physiological levels of the toxin 3 to knock down to overexpress FBXL3 and, uh, and check the levels for the protein. And we can actually see here that when we overexpress, we see reduction of uh, a toxin 3. But if we knock down choline 1, the enzyme uh, that will be uh, polybutynating a toxin 3 potentially, we, we uh, don't see any effect. Uh, so these activities seems to be SCF and, and choline 1 dependent. And so uh, to finish, uh, I just would like to uh, bring up that we could, like with these work so far, bring a new piece to this uh, uh, scheme and uh, by our identification of a FBOX protein that potentially would bring a toxin 3 to the complex for polyubicutination and proteasome degradation. And we are like exploring these mechanisms uh, farther in the lab as well as like uh, these very interesting um, uh, potential um, participation of like inflammation processes through TNF pathway, TNF and EF kappa B pathways uh, in the regulation of the abundance of a toxin 3. And finally, I just would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my lab, in particular, Lee, uh, Nyla Ashraf, which, which is my previous research assistant, and Eamon Yang, and uh, Annie and Emily that worked on this uh, on this uh, study, and my collaborators, in particular, Lee Sokol Todi from Wayne State University. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I showed at the beginning is a cell line that only expresses firefly will see phrase. We did that counter screen. Uh, sorry. Going back, a little difficult. Yeah, we uh, we did like a counter screen on our second um, second assay, secondary assay. Sorry. Normal wild type. Oh. Yeah, we also have that cell line, but we didn't do that in this, uh, in this approach. But uh, in uh, um, neuronal progenitor cells, where we, are, uh, where we have like physiological levels of mutant toxin 3 and normal toxin 3, we could see that FBXL3. So going back again to the, <laughs> the last slide, uh, we can see that FBXL3 uh, targets both forms, normal and, mu and mutant, so it's not selective for mutant in this case. So yeah, with these like uh, um, unbiased approaches, the, even if the target is like mutant to toxin 3, obviously uh, we will like find, I would think like the majority of the genes would like be regulating both. But there's, there's definitely an opportunity to identify also like selective genes that are only regulating mutant toxin 3. Sorry, I wanted to show you the last, but this is taking a long time. Here. So we see FBXL3. I only have uh, here the graph actually for mutant toxin 3. For the, when we overexpress FVXL3, we see decreased levels of mutant toxin 3, but we also see uh, for normal toxin 3 over here in the gel. I just cropped from the figure. Yeah. And then, uh, since I have the opportunity for a few more minutes, <laughs> we have like an extra a piece of data that if we <laughs> inhibit the activity of calling one by not allowing to be nedulated, we also see the same effect. So it is dependent of like SCF and calling one um, activity. Thank you. Thank you.